Alrighty, I do apologize for the te uh, technological ineptitude of your panelists up here, but thank you for bearing with us. Our, our tech guys managed to get us somewhere suitable, so we're going to walk you through our presentation, which is uh, Sewing 101. And I think we're going to start off with our introductions. So, hi, uh, my cosplay name is Itsuki Kobayashi. I know it's a mouthful, so you can call me Ichan or Ian, which is my real name. Uh, I've been cosplaying for over 10 years. Uh, I have my degree in an, an, an associate of applied science degree in fashion design and marketing, which is also a big mouthful. Um, uh, my deviant art is up there, uh, which you can visit and ask me questions about uh, any of my costumes or anything in general if you'd like. Uh, there are some examples of my work. Uh, I'm best known around the cosplay community for my makeup, craftsmanship, and crossplay. I am Holly Gloha. Huh? I've been cosplaying for about seven years. You can find me on Facebook or DeviantArt.com. On Facebook, I have two different accounts. One is Gloha.age, where you just hear my personal ramblings about whatever. And then Holly Gloha Cosplay, where you can watch in-progress photos of whatever costumes I'm currently working on. So you'll see the makings of a corset or some bows, since I'm working on a Victoria-era Sailor Venus that was based off of the art designs of No Flutter. And then I have my DeviantArt.com email address up there as well. And what I do there is once I post a finished when I have my costume finished and I have my photo shoots done, I'll post my photos there, and in the comments, I'll put how I made the costume, what patterns I've used, what tutorials I've used, what problems I've run into. If I use tutorials or patterns, I usually have links showing you what the patterns look like or where you can find the tutorials. That way, for example, if you want to do Sailor Moon, you see I did a Sailor Venus, you want to know what fabrics and patterns I use, you can actually go there and see how I made this costume and how you can apply this towards whatever it is that you want to make because the only reason myself and Ian made it up here is through tenacity and the generosity of cosplay cosplayers who were willing to share their information with us. We both do the pay it forward approach. And speaking of paying it forward, we are rather approachable. It, it may take us a day or two to get back to your questions if you email us, but we will definitively do our best to make sure we help you out as much as we can. And moving on, we're going to talk about the sewing machine. Now, if you notice in the upper right-hand corner, that is a Little Blue Brother sewing machine from Walmart. That sewing machine is up there because that is my personal sewing machine. That is the machine that made this costume, my rarities, all the other costumes that you will see throughout the slideshow presentation. Brother is a really good brand and I recommend it. And I got to give a little love to my sewing machine. It made this possible. We just have this quick little splash page up here to show you some of the parts of the sewing machine. So if we start talking about the bobbin winder, the balance wheel, the presser foot, the throat plates, you can kind of understand what we're talking about. And you can even type in like breakdown of a sewing machine and they can show you the different parts and how it all works together. The sewing machine hasn't changed much over the years. Instead of just a little foot treadle, now it is electric and the foot treadle is more like a gas pill that determines how fast the needle goes. But the most you would have to know about is maybe like the, the presser foot, the throat plate, the balance wheel, the, the bobbin winder, the thread. Those are the basics that when you're starting off, you're probably going to use the most, as well as the different um, stitch lengths on your thread. And we'll get into all of this. I just wanted this splash page so you can kind of get an idea of what we're talking about when we're live. We'll make sure your thread tension bob in this, and we're not confusing any people. We're segueing on way. Once you have your machine, and there is nothing wrong with the lower end brother machine, but once you have your machine, you've got to take care of it. And since I dominated that last slide, I'm going to pass this one on over. Oh, um, well, yeah, just, I mean, that's basically the gist of the slide is just take care of your machine. You need to take it in and have it serviced, you know, give it, you know, like you have to take in your car to have it oil change. You need to take in your machine so they can tune it up and oil it and grease it and make sure all the parts still work. You might have to uh, order replacement parts or have the, the uh, place where you take it in replace some parts occasionally if they wear out. Uh, Sometimes it can be cheaper if you have a cheaper machine, if, uh, like the Brother, I mean, they're, they're pretty durable machines, but they are plastic and they will wear out eventually. A lot of times it will just be cheaper to buy another cheap sewing machine rather than fix the one you have, or invest in something that's a little pricier, uh, maybe, you know, maybe you're not sure if this is something you're going to do for years and years, so you want to start out with a cheaper model, and maybe you want to graduate to a more expensive, sturdier model later down the line. 
uh, my sewing machine, my first sewing machine that I had was actually my great aunt's step, I don't know, my mom got it from her stepmother or an aunt or something. So it's been in my family for like three generations. It was made the same year my dad was born. It was made right here in Texas in 1961. So this thing is like 50 years old, it's solid metal, it weighs like 40 pounds. But I still use it and it still works great because it's been taken care of and that's an important you should always take care of your tools, especially such a complicated and expensive investment uh, as a sewing machine. And up on our slide here, we've got a lot of places that will service your machine. Some of these are big corporate industries. I noticed we've got like our Hancock fabric up there. Um, there's also little guys that specialize primarily in taking care of machines. A little bit of Google research will let you know who is good. These are awesome exclusive places like So Much More, Stitch Lab, City Service Sewing Machines, Textiles, and Quilters Folly. And if it's one of the little guys, because I'm a big proponent of support the little guys, you know, they're they're trying to introduce something needed into the, the cosplay industry, the, the fashion industry, and they're just trying to make a little business for themselves. But before you just drop your machine off with them, do a little Google research, see if they're good guys. If people are saying they're a little expensive, but my machine works great, they're a good investment versus I dropped my machine off and now it's not working you might want to avoid those guys. So if you're not awesome exclusive, all you have to do is type in, you know, um, servicing uh, places that service sewing machines. Google will tell you what's, uh, what's out there that can help you out and who has, or who's trustworthy. And guilt can help you out too. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually, personally, I use um, city service sewing machines always takes care of me and I, I know several fashion designers that are local to Austin that use that place. Um, and just a quick note also about one of the things that we have listed up here, textiles is actually a local fabric store. Gorgeous um, fabrics. Great stuff. Um, quick plug because I, I work there sometimes. Um, they, they go uh, usually once a month drive to LA to buy specific fabrics and they can do wish list services for that. But uh, they do simple repairs. Um, and they may be able to fix something for you, but chances are that they might have to, you know, recommend you to like city service for bigger problems that, that you know, just uh, a, a shop that exclusively deals with repair and upkeep of sewing machines. Just a little FYI on those. So we talked about, you know, getting the sewing machine and taking care of the sewing machine. So now, since this, you know, sewing is like <coughs> artistry, you need your tools. And we're just going to talk a little bit about Sewing Box 101 and what you should have in your sewing box. Um, we're going to start off with scissors. Um, I'm going to tell you from experience, they have spring-loaded scissors. Those are the ones you close, and then when you open up your hand, the scissors pop open. That's what you want to invest in, because the scissors that you have to manually open and close, after a while, your hand is going to eventually cramp up. You're not going to like sewing as much, and you're going to be cutting out a lot. You're going to be cutting out uh, uh, patterns and fabrics, and you want to have a good pair of scissors that's not going to cramp your hands up. And then peaking shears is always good if you have a problematic a fabric that likes to fray, you can just pink the ends. And the pinking is the one that kind of looks like a zigzag. It'll stop those fabrics from fraying up on you. Um, no. Oh. <laughs> okay. We, I would also say, you know, you're going to need pins. And no matter where you are in your sewing career, whether you're professional grade or you're beginner, the seam ripper is going to be your best friend. I cannot tell you how many sleeves I've sewn on inside out. <laughs> I, I, I really like it's a ridiculous amount it happens all the time whether you've been doing this for a month or 50 years I guarantee it's gonna happen <laughs> I'm, honestly I, I've used I've worn seam rippers out I, I use them so much all of a sudden the little razor on the inside is not sharp anymore and I'm like well, how many mistakes am I making and no matter where you are it's going to happen the seam ripper must be in your sewing box. It, it's a definitive must. A spare is also a good idea. And just, you know, just to show you the pictures, the, the seam ripper is that with the blue handle with the little silver hook and red ball. Yeah. That right there. I've got three. <laughs> and you, uh, that's one of the things that I'm always losing. I don't know about you, but yeah. like those are one of those small items that always seems to run away. Like, you know, I can never find tweezers either. Seam ripper's like, I'm so sick of popping threads. Bye! <laughs> The, uh, the bottom picture is the hem measuring tool. This is kind of good because so you can see if you have a definitive, uh, when you're sewing a pattern, they'll say, you know, you need a 3 8 hem, you need a half inch hem. That will help you keep an eye on what it looks like. And when you're looking at your sewing machine, you've got the area where the needle comes down. On the throat plate, there's little notches. That will help you figure out 
what notch is what, whether this one's a three-fourths inch, whether this one's a half inch. Some have it written on the throat plate, some don't, and if they don't, that hem measuring tool will come in quite handy for you. And you can also just take a ruler and put it on your sewing machine, let uh, manually bring down the needle, not so it hits the ruler, but just so you can see from the, from the needle in the central position, um, how far to the right uh, the line goes, and then that'll show you, you know, this is an eighth of an inch, this is a quarter of an inch, this is half an inch seam, or him. Seam, and then, of whatever. course, um, you know, measuring tape, thimble. Um, thimble usually is because if you're going to do hand sewing, you will mess up your fingers. No matter how long you've been sewing, even if you've got your fingers calloused up, it still hurts to hand sew. The thimble comes in quite handy. The best projects have blood, sweat, and tears in them. Literally. Literally. I have every costume I've pricked my finger and bled on it. I hate that that's my signature, but there it is. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, you're going to need machine needles, and you're going to need a lot of them. You want to make sure that you change these out occasionally. And they usually have boxes, like on the far right-hand side in the yellow. They will have different needles for different things. They'll say spandex, you know, this needle's for spandex, this uh, needle is for jeans. And then they'll have like different universal needles. Once you kind of know your fabrics a little bit better, you'll know what needle works with what. And we're going to get into this definitively uh, a little later in the slide. We're not going to just leave it hanging right there. You're going to need fabric pens, pencils, and chalks. And this will help you annotate, you know, where I'm going to cut, where we're going to put our notches. You can also use just, you know, regular sticks of chalk. That works great for fabric. Colored pencils are also an excellent uh, tool to mark directly on the fabric because they're wax, and as long as you write it on the wrong side of the fabric, no one's going to see it even if it doesn't wash out, which it will. And also with fabric pens, they have two different versions that I can think of off the top of my head. One is air soluble. You'll mark on it, and after about 15-20 seconds, the mark will disappear. And then they have a Waller's water soluble one where you mark on it and then you have to put water on it to get rid of the mark. Before you mark on any of your fabrics, practice on the swatch. There's nothing like taking a white fabric, scribbling all over it, and it's not coming off. Always practice on a swatch with pencils, pens, chalk, whatever you've got to make sure it really will come out. Um, also a hand sewing kit. As you get more advanced in your cosplay career or sewing career, you're going to be doing a lot of hand sewing. You're going to be doing hand beading, hand applique. You're going to be doing, um, like a lot of this lace on my, my Celestia costume was done by hand. And a lot of garment finish, even the very basic stuff, if it's lined, will have, a, you will have to hand finish a couple of inches worth of uh, hand, uh, seam. It's just a definitive of life. And then, of course, thread. And know your thread. I've talked to some people that went out and bought the beautiful embroidery thread because it was shiny and pretty, and then when they would sew something, it would just rip at the seams. So you'd want like a nice universal cotton thread. Because there, there are a lot of different types of threads, and there's so many different details that are out there and available. I mean, there's there are measurements of uh, how thick the fibers are, how many fibers per inch. I mean, they get ridiculously detailed. And if you're in, like, if you're a professional, uh, either with um, some designers know this, but all more so in the uh, uh, manufacturing industry is something that you really need to know. And but like Holly said, most of the time you just need a very universal uh, cotton or cotton polyester blend. Polyester works well too sometimes. Um, but the specialty threads, like the embroidery threads, as Holly said, just because they're pretty, they're they're not designed to hold the seam. They're designed for embroidery just to look pretty. They're not the strong like you need to, to hold the garment together. Alrighty. Let's segue into patterns. Now up here we have what we call the big four. We've got our Simplicity, Butterick, McCall's, and Vogue. Simplicity is fabulous when you're starting out. They don't have a lot of detailing. They have a lot of straight uh, seam work. The instructions are quite easy to follow when you open up the pattern and you've got your pattern and your instructions. You don't have to stop and do much research on it. That's the best place to start if you're going to start sewing. Butterick and McCall's are a little more advanced. That's if you want to take it up a level or two and just kind of challenge yourself, make things that are a little more appeasing to the eye. Vogue. A lot of the higher end designers will sell their designs to Vogue and we are talking very high-end couture level, knife pleating, ruching, gathering. It's stunning. They run a little bit of small, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, let me 
me try again. Wow, the patterns are stunning. The fabric or the sizing runs a little bit small, but it will be a very beautiful garment. But it will take a very long time. They don't really believe in simple. They believe in eye catching, jaw dropping. Once you're very strong and secure in your sewing abilities, challenge yourself to something from Vogue. But starting out, stay with simplicity and move up to Butterick and McCall's. And right now they have like the Halloween booklets out and it's very entertaining to flip to these because the people that make these costuming patterns know it's in vogue. You're gonna see a lot of very generic anime based looking costumes, little schoolgirl outfits. I was flipping through and there's very Game of Thrones looking outfits out there now because they know that is a big thing right now in the costuming genre. Uh, vogue is also a little more expensive and doesn't go on like it. They don't go on a sale the same format as the other ones do. You should never pay, except for Vogue, but for the other three, you should really never pay more than a dollar for a pattern. If you go in on a regular day, they're going to you know, be regular price and it'll be you know, somewhere between eight and twelve dollars. But they go on sale, each of those uh, brands go on sale at Batman at least once a month, and you can pick up you know, five for five dollars. That's usually the price that they do for you know, a two dollar patterns or something like that. So never pay full retail. But I'm also a cheapskate, so that's just kind of my rules for life. Um, Vogue is also, uh, they have a lot of historically accurate patterns. Like they have a lot of uh, classic designers like Chanel, um, you know, with the new look. They have vintage, vintage Vogue is very Vogue. 20s. Very, they, they have a lot of looks all the way from the 20s to the 50s um, that are very elegant and are also like the original fashion plate designs. Alrighty. Moving on, we got our little guys. We've got our Berta, our Quick Sew, and our Green Pepper. That corset pattern for the Berta up there is one I've been using quite a bit. I've actually graduated up to another pattern, but uh, I'll get to that in a second. But that Berta pattern for the corset has served me for many, many, many costumes. Berta was a Germany-based uh, pattern industry company. I think they were bought up by Simplicity. I like them because they're a little more fashionable. The, the Europeans believe in looking good day and night versus the Americans where we kind of have a casual laid back attitude about our clothing and then we kind of dress up at night. Is that, that one is a Hancock, right? Because it's not, it's yeah. Nice, yeah, it's not a Joanne's. You can yeah. only get Berta at a Hancock fabric. Quick Sew is good. They run true to size. I, I put that one up there because a lot of superhero costumes look a lot like the bodysuit that's presented up there. And they even have like a full bodysuit. So if you want to do like a cat suit or, or modify the pattern a little bit so it's a little baggier and you can kind of have like a Wonder Bolts outfit. And then lastly, the Green Pepper. That one's on there. With Sailor Moon Crystal out there, you're probably going to be seeing a lot of this pattern getting bought up because it looks like a Sailor Moon costume. I've used that one for my Sailor Venus. That one's a very good pattern to have in your little pattern collection. And these guys are actually good investments, even though they're not as renowned as the big four. And they'll have a lot of stuff that you can't find in the bigger ones sometimes. Um, like Berta, as Holly said, because they're European, they have a different sensibility and style to them. And you can find a lot of things that you can't find in the American. A the little more four fashionable, but not as high-end as Vogue. Oh yeah, yeah, it's not couture level necessarily. It's still more in the, the Butterick McCall's kind of range of skill. Alrighty. So we're moving on to independence. And these are some that I have used before. Uh, like Harriet's from Harriet's.com. She does a lot of very historical accurate things like uh, Civil War era ball gowns, uh, Civil War era uniforms, military style things. Um, PG of Williamsburg, the Scarlett O'Hara dress you see there in the green, that is the same exact pattern I did for my rarity yesterday. If you were here yesterday, I had a big puffy white dress, um, a purple ribbon running through the bus line. That's the pattern I used. And what they did is they were allowed to go into the warehouse where they were storing what was left of the Gone with the Wind outfits. They were allowed to make historically accurate patterns from these. So you can go in there, get these patterns, modify them a little bit if you need to. And, and make these actually stunning ball gowns. I know Ageless pattern tends to run with the uh, very Victorian Elizabethan looking costume, so if you want to do steampunk, I would say that would be the place to go. At the bottom, I have to give a special call out to Jessie Pridemore, who is known as Rufflebutt Cosplay. She did two patterns that I, I must insist that you have to have in your, your pattern gallery. One of them, it's mostly for the ladies, I'm sorry, gentlemen, 
But one of them is like a bunny suit pattern that looks amazing if you're going to do corsetry, if you're going to do superhero style costuming. I've been using, I modified her pattern to make my Celestia corset here. So instead of being the full bunny suit, I just kind of modified it to be more of a corset with a bust and an under bust. And then she does a full body suit, which unfortunately got cut off there. And she tries to keep the seams minimal. So I believe there's just like a seam on the back and on the inseam of the legs, and that's it. She, she does very clean lines. She does very good work. But as a cosplayer, and I think she's a fashion designer too, she knows what cosplayers look for, and she tries to give something that's easy to follow, very clean, and it comes in different sizes. She took her store down not too long ago, but she's been hinting that she's going to start putting like brand new patterns up there, so she might be on your watch list. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how to read a pattern, and I didn't bring one with me, I'm sorry. But when you look at the back of the pattern, or the back of the envelope, Above the price, you're going to have the different sizes. Before you even go in there, you might want to know what the bust is, which will be the biggest part of the, the bust area, the waist, which is the smallest part of the waist area, and then the hips, which is the biggest part of the hip area. Those are going to be the three sizes you need. If you find yourself in between, like, say, hypothetically, an 8 and a 10, you're like, well, you know, my bust and my waist are an 8, but my hips are a 10, go for the 10. It's easier to take things in than to let it out. And nobody's going to walk up and go, wow, are you a size 8? Never had it happen, and I hope people don't do it to be funny now. Um, and practically no one are these ideal measurements or these exact sizes that normal people are not uh, going to fall into those. So you will have to modify and take in you know, your waist or whatever based on the largest measurement, is how they said. And they even, like in the size and shape area, they even understand you know, they, they have like the, the triangle, the inverted triangle, the rectangle, the hourglass. They're just talking about the, the shapes that people have. The, the triangles, like the broad shoulders, and then it just kind of tapers down the legs. Some people, the opposite, they're small up top, and then they have the, the, the bigger hips, which uh, the rectangular shape and the hourglass shape. So they even show that whatever your body shape is, they will do their best to try and work with that. The level of difficulty is nice. Um, simplicity, like I said, is great for starting out. Average is usually what you normally see. Some will even say easy, very easy. I think there's even some that's like, you know, 20 minute skirt. There, there, there's like a one hour pattern. Yeah. Simplicity. So the text description will tell you what kind of fabrics you should use for this, whether you need to use a stretch fabric, whether you need to use a fabric with a little bit of stretch or a fabric with no stretch, and that will just determine after you make it, if you put it on, how well it will fit you. If it says you need stretch fabric and you don't use it, you're not going to be able to fit into that. Yeah, when, when you use a knit uh, fabric, or when a pattern is designed for a knit fabric, um, and you cut it out of a woven fabric, it doesn't stretch, so it'll be super small and it just won't work. And also, and this is something I skipped over, they have line drawings of what the garment is going to look like. And that's important because when you think of how you want a top and a pair of pants to look, it'll show you where the seams are. And you may look at this and go, well, it's got this giant seam running down the back of this jacket, and I don't want that because I want to put an emblem back there. This will show you, okay, this a garment is going to have a seam back there. That may be something that you say, well, I like this, but I may need to find something a little bit different. Oh! Uh-oh. Oh. Lost some phones. Okay. We'll get that back to them. We'll get that to them. So let's see what else. Okay, yes, once you have your size down, the yardage is important right there. That'll tell you how much fabric you need to buy. Starting out, I was never good at this, so I still have three or four yards of fabrics that I'm probably not going to use, but I still keep because you never know. But it's always better to find more than less. Yes. Um, because you can always save it. I mean, you can't return fabric that's been cut to the store, but you can always use it for later projects. And if you don't have enough, and then half your pattern piece when you lay it out is sticking off the fabric, you can't even use that fabric. You have to go buy more anyway. And sometimes Murphy's Law shows up and it's not there anymore, especially if it's yeah. like a specialty store where they have just two yards of this brocade, you ordered a yard and a half, she sold that last half a yard. Sorry. Yeah, not, yeah, they do a lot of, even the bigger chain stores have a lot of fabric that's only seasonal or just will be around one for one year. They have a lot of staples, but that's, you know, um, 
broadcloth cottons, um, jersey nets, th very plain, you know, solid colors, uh, pinstripe suiting, solid colored suiting. So those are always going to be available, denims, um, that kind of thing, the, the staples. But the, the more specific fabrics will definitely, uh, definitely have a higher chance of not being there later on. When you're looking at yardage, one of the uh, an important things to note is that it will probably will give you two um, measurement, two yardage measurements to buy based on your size, and that's because fabric generally comes in two widths on the bolt. It either comes in 60 inch or 45 inch. Um, there are other specialty types of fabric, like they make quilting fabric that comes up, goes up to like 120 inches wide for like the backing of blankets for quilters. Um, but generally, most fabrics come in about 45 inches. It goes from, from like 43 inches to 46 inches ish. It's all different. 60 inches, just around there, uh, you know, 58 to 62. Um, but you, you really need to pay attention to that because if you buy the wrong width, uh, you won't necessarily have enough fabric, or you may be buying way more fabric than you need. And this is just another envelope that I grabbed because it had just a little bit more information. You know, and it says when you're starting out, stick with the suggested fabrics. As you expand in your cosplay career, you'll start to learn traits of different fabrics. And I've got like a sheet that I can kind of go over after the, the slideshow presentations down. You'll, you'll learn what fabrics give a little more stretch, which ones don't, and it kind of helps you create the look that you want for your character. And let's see, yeah, I think everything else we just kind of covered right there. And it's, it's really great to go into the larger stores like a Joanne or Hancock's and when you're there and just look at all the fabric, feel the hand of the fabric, look at the drape, how does it move, how does it uh, hang, what does it feel like, is it soft, is it stiff, is it washable, is it, look at the labels, what's the fiber content. Would it go for a character is too? This a, uh, is this a fabric that uh, is going to breathe well enough for this, is it, is it, do you need a heavier fabric? Lighter fabric. What is it? Uh, just you just have to play with it and experience it, and that's how you learn to pick it up. You can look at pictures all day, but really to get that, at least for me, I know I, it's that kinetic uh, experience, learning experience of actually feeling and seeing it. All right. So I mentioned once you get your envelope on the inside, you're going to have the actual pattern, and then you're going to have a thicker sheet that has the actual instructions. I pulled this up because it shows you the different looks that you can get from a pattern that you buy. So they try to give you at least three or four different looks in one different pattern. Sometimes it's different types of peplum, sometimes it's different types of sleeves. They show you the breakdown of each piece and they number it so you know what pieces to look for depending on what you make. I want to draw special attention to the symbols down there. They tell you where to place the fabrics in accordance to the grain line so you get as much out of that fabric as you can. Uh, there's a picture that's not on here where they show you how to place the pattern pieces on the fabric. They do that so you can maximize your fabric. If you try to adjust it and tilt and, and angle things, you're going to use more fabric than you want. And when you put it on, since it's not with the grain line, it's going to twist, it's going to warp, it's going to hang unattractively on your body. And they have the little triangles there called notches. You have to cut those little notches so that when you're matching these pattern pieces up, you know that they're lining up correctly. Some people like to cut into the actual pattern itself. Myself, as I'm cutting, I actually cut the notch outside. So if I'm making a corset and this is the bust line and there's a notch on the bust area, instead of cutting into the bust area, I'll cut, do a notch, and then cut. That way when I cut in, there's no chance of me cutting into the same area where I'm supposed to sew. And I like to actually cut into the, hem, the um, seam allowance a little bit, just a straight line down the middle of the triangle. I don't cut the triangle out, I just cut a small line. Um, and your standard seam allowance is, on a commercial pattern is 5 eighths of an inch. So as long as you cut just you know a very small finger towards that, you probably aren't going to run into the problem of um, you know, cutting, cutting into where your seam's supposed to be. But if you're just starting out, Holly's Way is an excellent way to ensure that you absolutely will not uh, cut into your seam. Alrighty. So we were talking about the grain line, the warp, and the web. This is kind of what we're talking about. The selvage, when you look at your fabric, you've got this beautiful fabric, and then you have these rough perforated edges. Those rough perforated edges are the selvage, and usually since a lot of these fabrics are machine-made, that's basically where the machine will hold as it, as it threads you know, 
the loom and makes the fabric. Now, just just real quick, I want to um, clarify something on this diagram. When you buy fabric on a bolt, most of the time, unless it's like the home deck fabrics that are on the rolls, they come folded around uh, rectangular cardboard bolts, and then those fabrics are folded in half from selvage to selvage. The selvage is matching up and uh, folded right down the middle. So when you look at a fabric and it says on the end of the bolt 60 inches, and it just you know, it's like this big, and you're like, it's not 60 inches. Well, it is once you unfold it, but you're not going to want, well, generally, unless it's a very large pattern piece, you're not going to want to unfold it. You're going to actually want to keep that fold when you cut, because uh, when you're cutting out doubles of things, like you're going to want two sleeves on most gear garments, unless it's an asymmetrical design, you're going to want uh, to cut out two of one, so they're the same and on the same grain right line. And sometimes they'll mention a bias cut, and a bias cut is basically the 45 degree angle. Those are usually for things that are supposed to drape and flow. Um, for gowns, mostly, yes. things like that, very flowy, soft. It gives a little bit of stretch to the fabric when uh, it may not be any stretch of fabric to begin with. Alrighty, so we're going to talk a little bit about recommended fabric readings. One of the books I really wanted to draw attention to is one that I use quite definitively, and it's Sandra Bitsini's Fabric Savvy. And the reason why I mention this book is when you open up your book, let's say you're working with leather. You want to make something with leather, or let me start and see if I can't find something a little more. Okay, yeah, like cotton shirting. You know, she'll tell you how you should lay it out, what kind of markings you can use, how to cut it, if it needs interfacing, the type of thread, what kind of needle you should have in your machine. She'll talk about what kind of stretch length or stitch length, what kind of presser foot you should have, and then she just gives you a little bit of information about the fabric itself. So when you walk in there, you're like, I'm going to need this needle, I'm going to need this thread, I might need this interfacing. At the back of the book, and she does a lot of different fabrics. At the end of this class, you can stop by and flip through this book, see if it's something you're interested in. And I think she even talks about what kind of closures to uh, hems you should use, but she talks a little bit about seams. There's a couple pages of seams. This is something judges look for. So if you're going for craftsmanship and they start asking about seams, this gives you a few ideas of what kind of seams you can apply onto the garment that you're making, what kind of details you can use, um, closures, hems. This is a really good book to have. I, I'm personally, I use it quite a bit. Flip through it, see if you like it. If you do, go home, go on Amazon, get a nice used copy. I, I do recommend this one for the reading library. Uh, one of the... Oh. Oh, all right. One of the, one of the books that um, I used in school uh, when I was at fashion school um, is very similar to that book, and I think that book's actually a little easier for quick referencing, like the type of needles and the type of presser foots and things. Um, but the book that we used in our Construction 1 and 2 class is the Reader's Digest Guide to Sewing. And they have, again, tons of seams, um, different techniques, uh, fabric information, um, closures, uh, how to do different types of buttonholes and pockets, and all kinds of things. And these are um, not geared towards costuming, so specifically, they're just general garment guides. So these are, you know, functional, uh, everyday or special, uh, special occasion kind of techniques that could be used on professionally made manufactured garments. Another book is, you, you want to find yourself like a fabric swatch book. This is a good example of one online, or excuse me, one on the slideshow, and then one in person. Yeah, this is, this is actually the book that we use in school. But this is the same copy, I believe. And what basically these books are is they're a book full of swatches. So if you're going to make, like say you're going to do Princess Luna, and you're telling yourself, okay, well, I want to make sure I use a satin, you can kind of flip through and look at the different types of satin and say, well, you know, I don't like satin, but I kind of like silk a little bit more. The swatch book allows you to kind of go through, look at little types of fabric and see if it's the type of hand you need, if it's too thick, if it's too thin. It'll save you a trip to the fabric store and going there and seeing you know whether it works or not. You can just open up the book, kind of go through this. So when you walk in the fabric store, you can say, I'm looking for a silk, something similar to this. They might be able to help you out. You can find these books online too. For Sandra Bettina, that's easy. Just go on there, type up her name, and Fabric Savvy, you might be able to find it. For something like this, you might have to go on Amazon and type in like a swatch book. 
you know, this is what I'm looking for. And read the reviews on it, see what people who work with textiles have to say about the swatch book, see if it's a good investment or if they're saying this other book's a little bit better. So go out and buy some fabric. We got your big chain stores, your Joann's, your Hancock's, Walmart, Hobby Lobby. They're going to have the very basic of fabrics. You know, your, your basic bridal satins, your, your, your basic, basic brocades, quilting patterns, cottons. And there's nothing wrong with that. Those are staples of, of, of fashion. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to know that if you love this bridal fabric, this mad bridal fabric, chances are it's almost always going to be at these stores. You're going to have local stores like Textiles, Fabricer, or Common Thread. Those are going to be a little bit more specialty. They're going to have the heavier brocades, the prettier silks, the more fashionable fabrics that Joann's and Hancock can't quite get their hands on. More knits, more, yes. more specialty fashion fabrics, more uh, fashion forward fabrics rather than the staple conservative selection of the bigger chain stores. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they're online. There's uh, Sign Fabrics, Spoonflower, Stretch House Fabrics. And the best part at LeaveofFabric.com. A lot of these places will send you swatches for free or for a dollar. When I was looking for fabric for my No Flutter Sailor Venus, I was all over um, Mood Fabrics, and they sent me beautiful swatches of different kinds of silks until I found the one that I was looking for. Um, Mood is the store that they go to on Project One Way in New York. They have locations in New York and LA. And I actually went to the one in New York earlier this year, and it is heaven. It's like it's a warehouse. It's like an entire city block of nothing but fabric, and it's. I just wanted to roll around all of it. <laughs> I mean, there there are there were aisles where I mean it was deadly silent because you were so far away from the other customer or any employee. It's that big, and they are but they are very friendly. They work with designers all the time. They are willing to work with you, send you samples. Uh, you know, they give you discounts if you buy in bulk or join their frequent flyer 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 buyer club. Uh, but they are, they are, they can be pretty expensive. I mean, it's worth it, um, especially if you're looking for something special. I've got two and a half yards of silks coming in. That's that put me about sixty-five, seventy dollars behind. But if you're looking for like trims or faux fur, they are excellent resources. And I want to draw a little special attention towards Spoonflower and another one called Fabric on Demand. What's neat about these stores is if you want to do a print on your fabric. You can vector it on your computer, send it to them, and they will print this on your fabric. And this is good for people that want to do like Spider-Man or um, one of the costumes I want to do is an Arkham City version of Catwoman where she's got the hexagonal print, a very specific hexagonal print on her fabric. I'm not going to coincidentally find that anywhere. I know some cosplayers have sat down with paints and other trims and spent 20, 30 hours drawing that. I had somebody, I found somebody that vectored it, I can send it in, they'll print it out to me, they'll show me a preview before they do it, and it'll be, they have um, fabrics that stretch and fabrics that don't stretch. So if you want to do a beautiful kimono design and have that, you know, cranes and lotus blossoms printed on the fabric, they can do that for you. It's expensive, but it's beautiful. Last year, not this year, but the year before last, the girls that won the Best in Show at Acon up in Dallas used Spoonflower for their fabrics. And it was it was absolutely stunning. Their customs were photogenic, um, and they were just amazing seamstresses to begin with. So okay. they made it look amazing. They're very very talented and nice girls. I'm glad yeah. some nice one. It always <laughs> sucks when jerks are successful, don't you think? Oh my gosh. So if you want to learn how to sew, there's different schools out there. There's the big chain stores like Joanne and Hancock. And with cosplay becoming a little more mainstream, they understand that you know younger generations are out there trying to learn how to make costumes. Some people are out there because they love Project Runway. They're very helpful and informative, and they're, they're willing to work with that. There's also local. I learned at a place called the Stitching Studio. I took like a five-week class where you just showed up one day every day or one day a week for five weeks, and she taught me the very basics of sewing. Um, there's Stitch Lab, Austin School of Design. I love the local studios and the local guys because sometimes they'll do work shares. You may talk to them and say, listen, I don't have $150 to apply towards a class, and they may say, you know, well, if you come here and, you know, fold up our fabrics and clean up the store a little bit, we can take the price down a little bit. That's something that Joanne's and Hancock can't do. Yeah, because their prices are set by their corporate offices. Um, again,
again, I have to plug it just a little bit because, I, like I said, I sometimes work at textiles uh, in South Boston. We'll be offering some classes. I don't know exactly what which classes they're offering, but I know that they will be offering classes in October. Um, and they don't they offer really basic classes, but they also offer um, like designer boot camp classes and, and classes that explicitly. Uh, concentrate on manu the manufacturing process for mass production, which can be helpful because, um, you know, mass producing uh, production, you know, warehouse work, I mean, they crank stuff out like that. So it's always a good uh, uh, source of techniques and uh, skills yes. to, to learn the, the, that kind of professional level techniques because it'll make your work go so much quicker and less time for you to be aggravated. And I don't know if they still do it, but for a while, Stitching Studio was doing a thing where every Monday they would get together and they would just sew blankets and donate these to children's hospitals, charities, uh, uh, just all these good karmic places, battered women shelters. And if you showed up, she'd be willing to work with you as you're sewing a blanket. You could tell her, you know, I'm working on this pleated skirt. I'm just having the hardest times. You know, she as you're working on these blankets for her, she'd be willing to help you out. Oh, really? Wow. We kind of ran a little bit over. We're going to try and fly through these. We, we took a long time. Technical difficulties. Yeah. We're, we're but try to give the little guys some love. They can teach you too, as well as the big guys. Uh, if you need help, the internet. It is so accessible these days. My jaw just drops, and I love you, but I'm so jealous of how easy it is for you guys to learn new things. You've I, got I, it all. I, oh. I say this every panel, so if you heard it before, I apologize, but I, again, I'm just so amazed, as Holly said, that I have to say it, uh, when we started out, or at least when I started out, you know, over 10 years ago, you were lucky, like, you hit the jackpot, if you found a text file, like a .txt file on the internet, not in English, but in English, like, really broken English, barely comprehensible to native speakers, and then, if you were really lucky, like, this is like if you won the Powerball on top of winning the lotto, you, they had an ASCII diagram, you know, where they take the characters, the text characters, and draw shapes with it, like uh, old school video game walkthroughs. Like, man, that was the best day ever if you found oh, yeah. that back um, in the day. YouTube tutorials are just all over the place. Like, Videos, if you want to learn how to make steps. wings, how if you want to learn how to make a corset, if you want to learn how to make a skirt, YouTube it. Just, you know, I want to learn to make wings. Bam, it will pull up. It's very accessible. Cosplayers love making tutorials because they like to pay it forward and it gets them a little bit of attention. So it is out there. Do your Google foo. There's also recommended readings. Um, one of them is the Sewing Bible by Ruth Singer, which I have right here. As you're sewing, and if you're doing something like Vogue and you come across terminology you don't understand, she'll tell you what it is, like, you know, if you want to miter a corner. And you're like, well, what is mitering a corner? They tell you what it is and how to do it, but also it's online as well. And also cosplayers. Most cosplayers are willing to share tips and techniques. If you email me and you're like, that corset is gorgeous, how did you do it? What pattern? I'm going to share that information. Every now and then there's going to be one that doesn't. They, they, they want to share their information. That's when you just bow. I thank you for your time. And move on to somebody else. There's always going to be more helpful people than more conservative people. I'm not, I don't really use cosplay.com for like their gallery and their profile uses, but their forums are a wealth, an amazing wealth of knowledge and tutorials. So I can guarantee you most most of the time, even if it's kind of an obscure character, someone has posted the exact same question you're wondering about the exact same costume that you're making on that forum already, and it's been answered by you know 20 people. It's such an incredible database of knowledge. I highly recommend that as a resource. All right, so here's one that might get everyone's attention. Want to win a competition? If you're going for craftsmanship, you've got to take your time when you're so. Um, when somebody's outfit looks amazing, like seam work and hem work, it's not really noticeable. You're just like, oh, that looks great. But when it looks bad, it's very obvious. If you've got frayed edges and crooked seams, and that's, that's the sad thing about sewing is when it's fabulous, people just think, oh, that looks good. They don't understand the hard work in it. But still, do the hard work. Finish your hems. Attention to detail. If it means more work, it's worth it. Hand piping, applique, embroidery, they'll make your costume stand out. If, you, if, we, if we as judges see, uh, you know, the bottom of your hem, like if you have a dress, and we can see bits of thread dangling from your hem, either, even if it's on, I mean, I've seen it on stage, like that is an instant, that's probably not going to matter anything. And also, if you want to do best in show, best in shows are usually 
usually, not always, best craftsmanship and then best personality on stage. And sometimes it's, it's somebody, they may have a store-bought costume, but they did something jaw-dropping on stage. It's right off the top of my head, I can't really think of anything, but I know I've talked to other people who worked hard on a costume and then somebody else got up there. Okay, actually I can think of one. Um, I made a very simplistic Catwoman costume. It's a bodysuit and a tail. I got up there on stage and I was cracking that whip and I was being saucy to the audience, I was being saucy to the judges, and I strutted off that stage like I owned it. There was another girl in a stunning, stunning costume. She spent months working on this. She got best craftsmanship, I got best in show, and they even said, you own that stage. She got up there and she just posed, 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 and she was magnificent up there. I just brought more to the stage. So it can be done. There was a competition that I saw where the best in show went to a duo that they were very simple costumes. Honestly, there was nothing special about their costumes. They weren't bad, they were well done, but it was not, I mean, you'd pass them in the hall and go, oh, okay, that's a cool so-and-so, but I mean, it really wouldn't register as anything spectacular. But they walked away with best in show, and the judges said, you know, this is because they had a little story. They told story, and it was just a walk-on. It wasn't a skit. They were only on stage for 30 seconds, like the rest of the walk-ons. Um, but they told a story through their skit and through a use of props, and that's what got them that best in show. And that's just something to think about before you go into a co uh, cosplay competition. Go up there and have fun. It doesn't matter if you make it from scratch or if you closet cosplay. Get up there and have fun. But if you're going for craftsmanship, that's what judges look for, seams and hems, and they want to make sure that you know what you're talking about because there are people that are going to fake it and, and try to get up there and get the craftsmanship prize when they haven't earned it, honestly. I, I was a judge at one competition once, and a girl came up to me, and she was in a, a Madame Red outfit, um, her day-to-day her -day, like business suit-looking outfit from Black Butler, and she was saying, oh yeah, I drafted all the patterns myself from scratch, and no, I've never been formally trained, and blah, blah, and we just, red flags went up. We were like, N no, we, I don't believe you. Especially if a judge starts to get a little suspicious, they're going to ask some very technical questions that... If you made the costume, you'll be able to answer it. But if you didn't, they're they're looking to trip you up. They they really are. Oh, uh, wrapping it up, wrapping it up. We're on the last slide. Progress progress books, progress pictures, um, like documentation of your journey into making this costume are excellent for more serious, larger competitions because judges just eat that up. Because when we see that, we say, okay, these people. We see each and every step that they took. They know what they're talking about. They can answer our questions. Um, that's a great idea, and more and more cosplayers have been doing that. Thank you for your time. Thanks. <laughs>